your dreams are bigger, bolder, and more badass than the life you're living now, but something just keeps getting in the way. Join certified coach and former therapist Diane Wingert for the Driven Woman Podcast. She'll show you how to get rid of whatever is holding you back so you can stop spinning your wheels and up-level your life. Get ready to hop in and buckle up. This is the Driven Woman Podcast, and we're heading for the fast lane. Welcome back, Driven Woman. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, first of all, thank you for being along on this adventure with me. But if you've been listening for a while, you've probably heard me mention that my first career goal was I wanted to be an investigative reporter. I wanted to go into journalism. I got talked out of it and the rest, as they say, is history. But I've always been fascinated with people, especially women, who knew who they were and knew what they wanted to do with their lives at an early age, and they pursued it in spite of obstacles. Well, today's guest, Kelly Roy, happens to be the daughter of my long-term financial planner, a man I have come to dearly love over the years, not just because he manages my money far better than I ever could, but because he's funny and kind and oh so patient with me which I very much need from certain people in my life. But Kelly was absolutely a delight. And from the time Dan first started telling me about his daughter, I knew she would make a wonderful guest on the Driven Woman podcast. Let me tell you just a couple of things about the interview you're about to hear. One, Kelly is one of those people who knew who she was and what she wanted to do with her life from the age of 18. And she never looked back. Fascinating. Two, she had some difficulties growing up, including a pretty significant speech and language problem, which required years of speech therapy. But that not only didn't stop Kelly, she decided that the best way to get over it was to get on the debate team at school, even though her two older brothers were also on the debate team and very successful. She didn't stop there. Kelly decided she liked basketball. She wanted to play basketball. Now, this might remind you of an earlier guest, Trisha Dempsey, who also wanted to play basketball and was told that's not for girls. Well, Kelly's not the kind of woman who takes no for an answer either. So she decided she was going to play basketball. And when her coach told her, you know, you're just not that good, she didn't quit. She didn't take her ball and go home. She didn't find another sport or give up sports altogether. No, Kelly doubled down and told herself, well, then I guess I better find out how to get good. The subject of women, confidence, drive, and resiliency has fascinated me all my life. And I continue to be on the lookout for the very special women that I think would be inspiring and informative for you to hear from. So we are going to welcome Kelly in just a moment. I also want to make sure you stay with us because in a few minutes, I want to give you a special offer for something that I am going to be introducing this fall. There will be a link in the show notes, but I want to make sure you don't miss that announcement. So stay with us. And here we go. So Kelly and I first got connected through her dad, who has been handling my money for years. He is my financial advisor and Kelly is his daughter. And as long as I have known Dan, because I'm not very good at managing my own money. So I trust him to do that for me. And he's very good at it. He's always mentioned how proud he is of his kids. But it wasn't until recently that he told me about his daughter, Kelly. And within minutes, I knew I had to have her as a guest on the podcast. And you're about to find out why. So Kelly, welcome to The Driven Woman. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Diana. Thanks for having me. So Kelly, I think you have an interesting story. And it was even more interesting after what your dad told me than you and I met and had a lively conversation. And what I realized is that you really meet my criteria for a driven woman, meaning someone who very early in life 
feels like she needs to strive. She needs to do her best. She wants to achieve. She really, really enjoys excelling and competing and challenging herself. And how early would you say that you already had those qualities and it was pretty evident to everyone around you? You know, I would say it probably started when I was in first grade. It had to have been back then because that was when I was trying to prove I'm smarter than my body is letting me communicate. <laughs> I, hmm, I can do these things, that. but I'm not. Yeah. So, so when I was uh, very young, my mother was trying to figure out why I couldn't say the alphabet like the other kids. And I was having issues, but I felt like I was frustrated because I could say these things, but how did I, I wasn't coming out right. So after finding somebody who could properly diagnose me, I was able to start some speech therapy for uh, my communication language disorder that I had. So I had trouble receiving information properly and yes, <laughs> and then giving it back. So that I feel like that was the start of me just being like, no, I'm everyone else is not seeing what I want them to see. I I can show them better. I can, I can be better. So that's, that's to me when it definitely started. Which is a very interesting perspective for, well, because a first grader is like six years old. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you knew yeah. at six years old that I'm smart and I can communicate, but there's a gap between what I'm capable of and what I'm demonstrating and I'm frustrated by that gap, and I need to close that gap. I need to find a way to overcome this, to show them that who they think I am is not who I know myself to be. Absolutely. And, you know, luckily I had, you know, my mom who could be there with me going, I know, I believe you, Kelly, I know you can. So it was just, it was kind of like her and I trying to figure this journey out together. So I'm, I'm really lucky to have her by my side. Yeah, it helps tremendously to have a parent advocate. But what I'm curious about, and, and frankly, like ridiculously impressed by as well, is that where do you think that inner knowing comes from? Because in my experience over many years of being a therapist, and in the last five years being a coach, mm -hmm. most people's self awareness, their identity, who they believe themselves to be, is learned by the feedback they get from others. Now, it sounds like your mom agreed with you, accepted, um, recognized and, and felt that you were the person that you believe yourself to be. But I'm really getting the feeling that it was your inner knowing of yourself and not, well, my mom thinks I'm smart. So I guess I'm smart. It was really sounds like it was more the other way around, yeah. like mom, mom sees it too, but it's coming from yeah. inside of me. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, I know we've talked about this before, but I had two, I have two brothers. Uh, I'm the youngest of three and we're about two years apart. So watching them be very successful and in school, um, and because of our age difference as well, like I, I, I was watching them achieve and also watching them play with each other, but not me, right? So here mm. I am, this young child who would try and play with them. So I would, at one point, they just said, okay, there, here's the, the story they love to tell. Okay, you can be our secretary. So I would stay up in my room and think that I was playing with them all day. <laughs> but I what? started to take that time. Yes, but I started Wait to Wait a take minute, I don't understand. They they were playing with each other yeah. and they told you yes. you were the secretary. Yes. But that meant you were up in yes. your room what taking notes on the play that you were not a part of? Well, they would report in, right? They would say, "Okay, mm. we'll report in. We'll come back," you know. Um so I I really looked up to my brothers and I really wanted to be a part of they were good at soccer and 
I wanted to do that too. Whatever they did, I wanted to be a part of it. But I was the little younger sister. So I started to be more creative. I had that space because, of course, we didn't have the tablets back then. So I would be up in my room with a a typewriter, an old typewriter that I would pretend to type on and create my little worlds with GI Joes and blankets and Barbies. And um, I I mean, honestly, it probably was good for me because at the end of the day, I got to sit there and be with my thoughts and, and, you know, and start to create my own worlds. And I'm sure that that, you know, plays into my creative side now. So (laughs) yeah, I think there definitely was a benefit to you having that time with yourself, that solitude, because you are a creative person. So a creative person will fill that void with creativity. Um, Someone who's maybe less creative or more focused on the hurt of being excluded and alone would probably go in a totally different direction. But it's fascinating. Of course, as a younger sibling, you would be looking up to your older siblings, wanting to be a part of whatever they were doing. But it doesn't sound like you took the exclusion personally or perceived it as evidence that you're not okay in some way. You know, I will say, though, that I think I took it that time also as uh, they don't think I'm this or that, right? So instead of, I think I just took that as, well, I'm going to prove to them that I can be really good at something too. And they're going to want to play with me. You know what I mean? I'm going to show them the amazing person I can become, right? So I used my brothers as that like starting off point of I'm proving to myself and to everybody else that I'm this smart and I'm proving that I'm good at sports and right. So that that's, I I used all of that as needing that. That's where my competitive side came from. I mean, yeah. You used your circumstances to as fuel to propel you, but you had the spark and you had the incentive and you had something to push against. You had had a few things to push against and What I found most fascinating, um, and I'd love for you to share with the audience, is that here you are, a kid who can't play with the older brothers. You're up in your room, you know, fantasizing and coming up with things on your own. But your specific challenge was in speech and language, speech and communication. And let's fast forward a bit to high school. What did you decide to do to advance yourself in that area? (laughs) Yeah, so I joined the speech and debate team. And and my brother had excelled at a state and I don't know at that time national level for speech and performing. So yeah, I was like, you know, that's that's what I'm going to do. That's I want I really enjoy seeing those performers and I can be good at that too. <laughs> It's so, so yeah, interesting I, because I so I, many people who are younger siblings will say, well, yeah, my older sibling is doing that. So that's like taken. So I need to do right. something else. Like he's the one who's good in the debate team. So I'll learn how to play a musical instrument or he's the one who's good in sports. So I'll be good at arts and crafts. You went right to the things that you had those role models of success and decided to compete with them on their own turf even in the very area where you had a diagnosed challenge. Yeah. I think that's exceptional, Kelly. Thank you. You you know, I also, I don't think I looked at it as I'm going to be as good as him. Mm. I looked at it as I'm going to be good in my way. People are going to still, you know, I don't think I looked at it as I, I want to take away from him. I just, I wanted, maybe I wanted to show him I could also do it and prove to myself that I was, I was able to do something like that with my disability for sure. I mm-hmm. think that that was probably something going on in the background, but you know, you don't focus on that as a kid. No, I mean, and, and again, you know, we're yeah. doing something it's that all adults do. Yeah, we're we're looking yeah. back with our adults' right. eyes and mind and mindset and thinking, but it is very interesting that 
you didn't tell yourself I need to be the best. You didn't tell yourself I need to be better than my brother. You told yourself I need to show him, show me, show everybody that I can do this too, to the best of my ability. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, the fact that the only performance that got me to state the state competition was the one, the, the performance that I wrote my, my own writing is what got me there. It wasn't the stuff that I, I performed that was already written. It was, it was my own. So even though I didn't win at state, it was an achievement that, that proved to myself something, you know, I could, write something, I could perform it. Yeah. So that was, that was, that was a definitely a good moment. Yeah. The different aspects, you, you knew what you liked about it, right? You, something to prove yeah. Yeah. you had that yeah. stimulus, but you, you are obviously a creative and that was really important. And these are things because I work with a lot of creative people. I find that oftentimes someone who is really likes to challenge themselves and frankly, puts themselves in difficult situations to challenge themselves. You're smiling because this is, <laughs> this is what that's, you do. That's me. <laughs> I do that. I'm afraid of heights and I do it. <laughs> right. We're going to talk uh, a lot about yeah. your career and how you have shaped your career according to your personality and the fact that you like to challenge yourself. Um, but I think it's really interesting that you're a creative, but you're also a person who likes to challenge themselves because a lot of creative people are very, very sensitive. You know this because of the career you're in and very, very sensitive people oftentimes are not comfortable challenging themselves or being challenged because of their fear of criticism. Now I have alluded to your career, so I think we should probably just spill the tea and tell everybody what it is that you do. And I think especially how you knew from a very early age, not only what you had inside of you, in spite of your diagnosis, but you also knew what you wanted to do with your life and you're still doing it. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I am a casting director for film and television. Um, I started to figure out what I wanted to do right around uh, college. And when I knew I I wanted to be in the industry, I just couldn't figure out where I fit. Did you want me to go into that right now? Yeah, I think just, you know, Uh, what what you had shared with me was that you loved seeing films and you would imagine some of your favorite female actors who were in roles. They were early on in their career. And you imagine I'd love to see her in this type of film. And you didn't even know what it was called yeah. then, right? Yeah. I'm, uh, so knowing I had that background and in, in watching performers. So I watched performers in rooms for speech and debate, right? You wouldn't always just be performing. You could also sit in the back and watch. So I knew I really enjoyed when someone was good. I could, I, I really enjoyed these performances. And then I started to realize that my appreciation of actors also when I was watching a movie or a TV show, I was, I would just think they're in such a small role, but I, I want them to be, I want to be the person who's the person that gives them the job. I want, they should be in more things. How do I do that? And then I realized there is a job for that. It's called a casting director. Uh, and I don't even remember how I figured that out, but I just knew that that was what it was called. So when I went to film school at San Francisco state, Everyone else in film school would say, I'm going to be a director. I'm going to be a producer. I'm not in Hollywood. I'm this and that. And I would say, well, I'm going to be a casting director. And they would all look at me like, okay, like that's weird. (laughs) What was weird about it to people who were in film school with you? I think no one knew what that was. I don't think people, the casting, a casting director isn't a job that people talk about. You don't hear about that when you're going to school, when you, when you have career day, you don't, you don't know about that, which is actually why I've done a lot of job fairs at my, uh, the junior high I went to, um, where I'll show up and I have my little booth and I tell them what a casting director is because people don't know about all of the small little jobs in our industry, but I figured it out. And 
Luckily, I had my middle brother who was working at a talent agency and he was able to point me to some casting directors he really enjoyed working with as an assistant. And that's how I met my partner, um, Anne McCarthy, who I very, very grateful for. (laughs) And are you still working with her after all these years? After all these years, I started as her intern. And then it was just kind of at one point as as in, in casting, things ebb and flow and we had the recession and all of that. But Annie and I always stuck together. And so the company started as one thing when I was with her and it morphed into something that we got to create together, um, our current, our current core group of uh, four women um, that I'm very, very proud to work with. Uh, And, but, you know, you, you were talking about how um, self criticism and sensitive people, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I'm for sure a sensitive person. And I, I don't think I take, criticism all that well. I I work on it. Um, But uh, when I was starting out, you know, going into that business, it was really hard to deal with people who maybe weren't going to speak as nicely to me on the other line. And and to to handle, to become a businesswoman, I had a mentor, which is my partner. So, you know, Annie was the one who would be pushing me going, you got to be tougher. You got to be, you know, you got to be able to take it, right? So she's definitely helped to push me to be that because I was, it was a hard thing to learn for me, for sure, mm. because of the, the sensitivity like you were, you were mentioning. I'd like to think I'm a, I'm a stronger woman because of her, for sure. Well, I've had a lot of clients tell me that they consider their sensitivity to be a weakness, a liability even. They, it's something they feel embarrassed about, or they've even been teased about or, or bully, bullied about in childhood. So a lot of gifted, creative, sensitive people feel very self-conscious about their sensitivity and are kind of defensive about it. But I think it is a gift and I think it is absolutely related to creativity, but as you said, sure. it does need to be managed. And some of the things we can yeah. get into are obviously rejection sensitivity, which is something I've been talking about a lot recently, but also imposter syndrome. And I think it's maybe something that's nuanced and not really well understood is here here you are a person who has known from a very early age in life that you want to achieve. You want to accomplish things. You like to challenge yourself. And just because you happen to have a communication disorder, that's not going to hold you back because it has nothing to do with how capable you are or how smart you are or how driven you are. And you're going to prove all of that. But at the same time, you're creative and you're sensitive. So it's just a very interesting and nuanced thing for me uh, and the people that I work with how do you manage and balance the two to keep pushing yourself, to keep putting yourself into challenging situations, knowing full well that you have this sensitivity that you need to protect? How do you deal with that personally? Well, what's a fascinating thing about my career that I don't know any other careers that are like this is the sensitivity So our job is creative. You need a creative mind and a business mind. Those are two things that exist. We are, it's a combination. So the sensitivity is definitely important. Um, When I, it's been a while since I've gotten to be physically like in a room with an actor, but I, Mm -hmm. I have spent my career being in the room and using my sensitivity to pick up on what I need from the actor in the room to direct them. Hmm. And so it it is an asset, like you were saying, it's it's definitely an asset to me. And it, you know, it feels good when I cry in a room and for that actor, right. They, Hmm. they've touched me in some way, right. We're, we're, we, we get to be connected. You're looking for that, right? Like you're looking to be impacted. Yes. I'm looking to connect with them on an emotional level to be in that scene with them. I I'm there with them, right? We're a team 
in the room. So I get to have that creative side and it, and, you know, for sensitive people, the validation we talk about too. Mm -hmm. I, I also receive a lot of validation in the room from actors, which feels really good when they feel welcomed and, and they feel appreciated. Like we're there, not as a job interview, as much as I'm their, their, their teammate in the room, you know, and that, that feels really good. Anytime they walk away going, thank you. And uh, th there are so many times where we're like, yeah, I mean, of course, why, what would you expect? Like, who, who's hurt you? <laughs> like we're, I'm on your side. Right. So, um, it feels really good to have that there. And then I, I have to switch kind of a mindset when I'm in business. Uh, and sometimes I do have to just, you know, I have to be a little tougher, but it doesn't feel like against my nature anymore. I think I've found the balance. I, I can't explain it other than I've just embraced that I'm going to say what I think. I can't pretend to be somebody else. So when I stand up for myself and I say, well, hang on, you know, this is what's going on and or or for the producers and directors I work with to to not like stand back, but be like, you know, you brought us on for a reason. You you know that we're we're the person who knows this field. So I, I'm going to share my opinion. I'm not going to hold back. And they respect it. That's what I learned instead of. I used to be a little bit more timid about sharing my thoughts, feeling like I didn't have enough experience under my belt, right? I didn't, I'm not the expert, right? And then I just started to embrace, well, hang on, no, look at my resume, maybe some other people, their resume, and just in the sense to give myself the confidence to say, hey, no, no, no imposter syndrome here, like embrace this. And, and they came to you for a reason. So help them, you know, just because I think there's uh, sometimes men can come off as they know, really know what they're talking about, whether mm -hmm. they have any experience whatsoever. And to just say, hey, wait, no, you know, <laughs> I might be nice, but that doesn't mean I'm going to just sit there and go, oh, well, he really knows what he's talking. No, tell him what you know. Share your your knowledge. That's what he's here for, right? Whether they know it or not sometimes. <laughs> hey, Driven Woman. I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. Maybe you've been listening to it from the beginning, or maybe you are a brand new listener. But either way, I am so glad you're here. And I hope that you are being inspired and motivated and actually learning how to move your life forward with each and every episode you hear. But I want you to know that there is a whole other level that is so much more powerful, and that is actually working with me. I want to invite you to consider that this fall, fall 2021, is your time. I'm reintroducing my group coaching program. It'll be a small group experience that I will carefully curate by choosing the just right members. You might be one of them. To get on the interest list, click on the link in the show notes. There's no obligation, but you won't be able to hear the details unless you get on the list. Okay, so it's coming soon. I want to make sure that you learn everything you want to know to make the right choice for you. Now, if one on one is the only way for you to go, there's a link for that, too. That starts with a free consultation to make sure that I'm the right coach for the right reason at the right time for you. But if group is more your jam, you got to get on the list. You want to hear from one of my other clients and what she felt about working with me? Have a listen to this. I adopted this phrase of this is what we do here instead of trying to make it like for the longest time I was trying to make it fit everybody's needs where you were attracted. Yes. So that was, I think, the struggle bus. And I don't think I was aware of that. I was um, just because I love people. And when you have potential, I can help you get there. So I think I was allowing too much wiggle. And that's what you helped me through mostly in my memory of like figuring out that it's okay to say, no, this is what we do here. This is that stance. 
And that's how Beyond Common, you know, 12 Essentials for Success in Life, and it finally was completed. It was just like this pieces and parts of things that we had done that worked to make us successful. But it was like through that figuring out how to connect everything. And definitely your influence helped me so much. Like it was like, you know, you're, you're an angel. Oh my goodness. Um, you are yeah. speaking <laughs> my language on so, no, no, you're speaking yeah. my language on so many levels. One of the articles that I refer to most often, and I will link to it in the show notes is from the Atlantic magazine. It's from 2018. I talk about it all the time because this topic keeps coming up. The, the title of the article is The Confidence Gap. And the Reader's mm -hmm. Digest version is it speaks to the fact that a man will apply for a job when he meets 50% of the qualifications, and he'll be fully confident that he'll get the interview, if not the job itself. A woman will not even think of applying unless she meets 100% of the stated criteria. And when she gets the interview, she feels lucky. Now, I think the fact that it's 2021 and this is still the case is so frustrating to me because I have nothing against men. And I, I frankly think when people right. have the confidence to go after something that they might not yet be qualified for, knowing that if they get it, they will fill that gap and they will work their butt off and they will learn as quickly as they possibly can. What concerns me is that women have a default of self-doubt, modesty, and undervaluing their experience. And I, you use the term expert, and I think this term has become like really a hot topic for me because once upon a time, not so many years ago, an expert was someone who had a lot of tread on their tires in their profession, who had been doing their craft, their occupation for a long time at a high level and successfully. But as a result of the internet and social media and digital marketing, anybody can call themselves an expert. And if they are convincing, people will accept that at face value. Meanwhile, individuals who truly have expertise feel that that's kind of yucky. My husband and I used to refer to people with the acronym SSP, which stands for shamelessly self-promoting. And that always felt like really gross. Like, wow, this person thinks quite a bit of themselves. I'm all for confidence, Kelly. But what concerns me is how many highly qualified women undervalue themselves and are overly modest about stating that they are, yes. in fact, experts. You are, in fact, an expert. And unfortunately, confidence sells. So the person who is less of an expert, who comes across in a very confident way, will oftentimes get the job while the more qualified but more modest person won't. And oftentimes that person is a woman. Yeah. And in my industry, there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen, if you will. And even though we're not competing with them for the job, there are producers. There might be a lot of producers in that mix. And there might be some that have what you're saying, like they just have this confidence and, and they're not listening to that person. So if they're, if like you were talking about the meek sort of aspect, if a, I've learned that men seem to respond and respect women more, if they're like, no, actually, no, you know, and you, you stand up. And, and so it's like what you said, I, I have nothing against, you know, men, it's not like, he said, you're nothing, you're this, you're that. It's what you are, are thinking about yourself. So, yes. So then I, it just suddenly clicked of, but it took me taking sm really smaller, smaller projects where I really did know, okay, I am the expert here. I, wow, I am the one with the resume and, and they all, they actually all need me. They need my connections. They need my friendships with, with all of these people in the industry. 
and I'm, it's going to be kind of on my back. So it took those smaller projects for me to find that, um, ability to say, no, what you're saying is wrong. Actually, <laughs> let me help you guys, but you know, tactfully try and, and steer them in the correct way, despite what they think is the case because that's what they hired me for. So I, I'm, I'm there to steer people who, you know, uh, as they say, you can only lead a horse to water, but, um, <laughs> uh, that, that's my job to lead them to the water. And, and if they, if they choose to drink, that's, that's, that's up to them because, uh, I can't force them to, um, but sometimes I do force it when it's smaller projects. That part's not your job. <laughs> That's yeah, not my job. But, it's not my job. But you've also but I said learned, that I learned to to do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> to push yourself as a result of establishing the confidence with the smaller projects and then working your way up. But when in our yeah. previous conversation, you were talking about the fact that you like to cast the films that are interesting to you. Yeah. And they're not necessarily the blockbusters. Like, and I think I find this often with women that we like to do work that is personally meaningful and satisfying to us because it's in alignment with our values, with what matters to us. We're not necessarily going for the big name, the big title, the big paycheck. We want to do the work that we feel proud of, that we find interesting and challenging and yeah. sometimes those are the smaller projects, aren't they? Yeah. Um, smaller projects too, you can really put your, um, I mean, I, I, I would say you get to have your fingerprint on them a little bit more because not as many cooks in the kitchen, you don't have the studio and uh, who has to approve and they have a certain, you know, level name that they need. Right now it doesn't take away from the fun that I have on, you know, these big action movies, they're, they're their own challenge, right? Because I, I love watching big action movies. My dad loves to count the stuntmen, you know, but we end up doing a lot of, a lot of horror movies as well. But, you know, the, like we, for me, I want to work on things. And I think all of us in my office would agree, we want to work on things that we're passionate about that we want to see. And if there's something we don't believe in, then I can't pitch that around town. I can't, I'm not a very good liar. So I can't call people in, around town and say, yeah, put your actors in this. This is great. You should do this unless I believe it, unless I believe that this could be something, you know? Well, this is what integrity looks like for you, Kelly. Yeah. There are people that that's yeah. not. I mean, they want to make the money, they want to have the big name, they want to be associated with certain players, and that's what's important to them. What's important to you is the challenging project that you have passion for and you are willing to have your name associated with. It's much more of an intimate situation, and as I've come to understand better what a casting director is as a result of our conversations, it makes complete sense that it is a female dominated profession because I think yeah. the way you approach these things sounds more like most of the women I've known. Yeah. Yeah. And I think integrity, like you were mentioning that that's exactly it. Integrity. I feel like has equaled our longevity, you know, like our, our, our business people come in and out and there are not like how many lawyers are there in the world? right? Too many. <laughs> well, look at, right. How many of all these different professions, but casting directors, I don't know, there are 3000 in, in the world. I, you know, like 5,000, who knows? And wow. There, there are, there are not that many people in the scheme of the world. It, I, I'm, I'm sure I got that fact wrong, but I think in, in, but it's the in United thousands, States, not, not the millions. No, yeah, definitely not. Because there's only so many movies and TV shows out there. We are lucky, and we haven't always been, to be able to choose, be a little bit more 
um, selective and, and so selective, if you will, selective, because we, yeah, we, 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 we're not going to choose something maybe that, you know, we feel right. And I think anybody would in any profession would feel this, that, you know, like that we don't believe in, like I said, and, and isn't a good business choice. Right. But, but not everyone can do that. So I don't want to feel like, you know, we only choose things that we're passionate about. That's not every, not every casting director can do that. They need to make a living and they're, they're, and, and to each their own too, as well. So just because I don't respond to, you know, the torture porn type of movies doesn't mean that there's not an audience for that. There doesn't mean people don't love life, you know, like uh, there, there are certain TV movies that maybe aren't for me, but they're for so many people. So I, you know, we get to choose what, what our brand is. No, there's tons of different genres out there. Yeah, we get to choose what our brand is and what we, we like. Which I think is ideal. I mean, when you think about the fact that you figured out who you were very early in life, you developed your persistence, your resiliency, your determination, and you tested yourself over time. You maintained your creativity and your sensitivity, and you developed your entrepreneurial acumen and your business mindset and continued to do what you love. I mean, how how many people really love what they do and chose it, didn't fall into it or say, well, it makes it good money or it meets my needs or it's what the family does or whatever. People do things for all kinds of different reasons, but you chose something that's extremely well suited to you and you shaped the business that you have around what you love to do with people you love to work with. I mean, it's like a near perfect situation. But I think as we're wrapping up, I'm thinking about what initially got you started in pushing yourself and driving yourself and motivating yourself to achieve and accomplish. Are they the same things that drive you now or have they changed over time? What, what makes Kelly driven now? Um, that's a tough question. I, I think I ask myself that a lot. Yeah. So I think it's about mostly about myself and what I can, what I can achieve. I mean, I know my, I know my family's proud of me, but it, it does start to feel like, well, they're so used to this level that to me, it just looks like they're just going, yeah, another good job. Right. And so I take that as you probably feel the same way, don't you? Right, right. So that's what you expect of yourself. Like, oh, good, mm-hmm. right? It's like the girl. Right. It's like the kid that's always been an A student. Everybody expects A's. You continue mm-hmm. to churn yeah. out A's. Like, okay, here we go, another A. Like <laughs> that is such a perfect metaphor. That's exactly that's exactly the feeling. So what's higher than an A? I, I don't know. So that's why taking on, I think what drives me is how do I beat that A? How, what's the next level? So it is taking on challenging things, pushing myself in, in, in different ways. And that's what you can do in my industry. You can, there's so many different ways to push yourself there. What's one example of that? My favorite example and the, one of my favorite um, movies that I, I've done is uh, a movie called The Man Who Killed Hitler and then The Bigfoot, which sounds like an insane title. And uh, my dear friend now... Wait, is that... That's one title? <laughs> oh, my. That's one title. And my, wow. my dear friend, uh, Robert Krzykowski, he was a first-time feature director. And he came to me, and it was one of the most beautiful scripts I've ever read. And I believed in it. And I, I'm so I'm looking at him and he's got John Sayles, who's this, you know, genius legend in indie filmmaking, believed in him. He had all these amazing mentors around him, but he just, just a nice guy going, here's it, here it is. So him and I just went out and we got Sam Elliott and wow. we created, we, you know, Ron Livingston and uh, it just Aiden Turner. We, we had this amazing cast that we, it, it just, everyone was kind of looking at it going, you can't do that. Right. But I believed in him 
And he believed in me and we went out and, you know, next thing I know, Sam Elliott is going, Hey, come on, Kelly. I want you to be at my, my hand, uh, handprint and footprint ceremony at, in Hollywood. And, and mm-hmm. I'm just going, where am I? Lady Gaga is over there. Do I belong here? <laughs> but it, it's not about that moment. What was special to me is that it meant so much to Sam and he was thinking, me for that. So you you go back two years and go, man, that was pushing a rock up a hill. And I got to the top of the hill with the rock, right? I did it. That that just having everyone look at you going, this movie isn't going to get made. And you're just like, we did it. That that to me, versus any commercial movie we can do meant so much, right? Because anybody with a hundred million dollars can make a movie, but when you're making it kind of from nothing, it feels really good. You and I are sisters from another mister. I will tell you, like <laughs> it's, it's just, and it's so fascinating to hear you say that what got you all in on this, like I am going to make this happen was the feedback. Yeah. You're not going to be able to do this. Like, you can't make yes. this movie like this is not happening. And you're like, oh, yeah, just watch this me. This title, right? It, the title, I, that's that's excruciatingly yeah. bad. <laughs> like it's so many words. Yes. But but you did it. You got the right talent. And yeah. it was like, it's just dangling that carrot for you, Kelly, and saying, nah, that's just not doable that lights your fire and it has been your whole life. Like that's your spark and you've leveraged it beautifully to create a really satisfying career. And it's, that wouldn't work for everybody. That would not work for everybody. There are many people who will hear that you can't do that. You can't be on the debate team. You have a communication disorder, you silly girl, like you can't be a casting director. You can't cast this film. You can't, you can't, you can't. And instead of thinking, oh yeah, they're probably right. Maybe I am a little unrealistic. You said, watch me. And I love that about you. I think it, it's it is fabulous. It is really strange. I had to thank my, uh, my, uh, my language therapist, I actually thanked her this past year. She hadn't heard from me since I was a kid. And I said, I just need to thank you because I I communicate for a living in a room. I have to on the spot, find my thoughts and, you know, and come back really quick to communicate to actor. How I wouldn't be here without her. You know, it's, uh, I know it's, and, and I feel, I feel very, you wouldn't blessed. be here without her, but your mom also, I think having the sure, parent yeah. to be by your side, but I think you are not giving yourself quite enough credit here. I'm, I'm certain that the speech therapy at the right time for the right reasons with the parental support, all of that was necessary, but you have the inner belief I think it ultimately, this is my current theory. I think our identity is the driver of everything. And your identity was not consistent with the feedback you were getting from others. And you just wanted an opportunity to prove who you really were. And you never stopped doing that. 100%. And it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Like, but without all the yuckiness, because I've certainly known people who get on that path of, needing to prove themselves for all kinds of reasons. And they're never really able to be satisfied with any of their accomplishments because it's not coming from a a healthy place. It's coming from a place of hurt Mm -hmm. and resentment and, and all that. And yours isn't, you're just like, Oh, of course they aren't expecting much. They don't know who they're dealing with. (laughs) 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 Oh, yes. (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing your life, your story, your wonderful perspective. I really like to think that this show can inspire other women who know they have the drive and maybe there's an obstacle. It might not be the same one that you had, but that with the right mindset and the right effort, 
you can absolutely close the gap and create a beautiful life for yourself as you have done. So thank you so much for being our guest today. And can I connect people with you through the show notes, how they can find you either your website, social media, if they happen to be indie filmmakers who know she's the one for me. <laughs> I, I am on IMDb. That sounds true. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I have some contact info on there. <laughs> okay. I'd be happy to link you. Kelly, thank you so much. This was delightful. Thank you, Diane. You've been listening to the Driven Woman Podcast with Diane Wingert. Want more straight talk and strategy each week that will take you from spinning to winning? Don't forget to hit subscribe in your podcast player so you won't miss a single episode. Then head on over to the Driven Woman free and private Facebook group community. See you there.